Open your Bibles with me to the book of Ephesians, and in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 is what we're going to look at. And then we're going to read down to the beginning of verse 8. So Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. The Apostle Paul writes these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. Let us ask that God would enable us to understand the truth of his word in prayer. Gracious Father, I pray for grace to preach your word accurately and properly, and I ask for those who hear that they would be encouraged, those whom you have already saved, that they would grow in grace and grow in conformity to the image of Christ. And Lord, if there is unbelievers hearing these very words of mine, and as I preach, they hear the message of the gospel brought forth, may they be converted, and may they flee to the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, for your glory, Father. May you be glorified in this and as it has effect upon our lives. And I ask these things in the name of your dear Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen and amen. Christology, the study of Christ. It is a weighty and glorious subject. And it ought to be something that is heavy upon our hearts and our minds constantly. It ought to be that which we find our joy in. Considering the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, the glorious Savior, the Son of Man, and the Son of God. It is the more, most important subject, one that deserves our undivided attention and that is worthy of our diligent study. And it is a must when one is considering and studying the subject of salvation. When we look at the gospel and uh, soteriology, which would be the study of salvation, we must go here. We must cover this base well. Because Christ is the centerpiece of it all. Especially when it comes to this study of salvation, not only is he the centerpiece of all of Scripture and all of theology as a whole, but specifically in reference to studying salvation, he's the heart of it. In fact, one cannot do a thorough study of salvation and a thorough study without the uh, about the gospel without first considering and, and studying deeply who is the gospel about. It's about Christ. It is often called in the New Testament the gospel of Christ for that very reason. And it is the gospel of Christ's redemptive work. In fact, that's where we find ourselves here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, where it speaks on Christ redeeming us, something that is often spoken about in the New Testament text. But we ask ourselves, in reference to Christ's redeeming work, what exactly does he procure for us and bring about for us? How does he do it? And why does he do this? What, how, and why? Well, we must go to the scriptures. We must. We must consult the body which God has inspired, the body of texts which God has caused to be written, which testify to this glorious redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that is what we're going to consult here, is this text here, these two verses in Ephesians 1. But before we do, of course, as we do every time we consider a text of Scripture, we must, we must take into account the context. What is the author in the, the whole grand scheme of things saying? And, uh, and Ephesians 1 is it's all about salvation. It's a salvific chapter. And specifically, it's speaking on the Trinity and how the, the members of the Trinity work together to bring about salvation for the people of God. That, that's really what all of Ephesians is about, at least the first, or excuse me, all of Ephesians 1, at least the first half of it, in verses 1 through 14. 
And then toward the end of the chapter, the other half of the chapter is more about Paul and his relation to the Ephesians. He commends their faith. Um, he also expresses that he is praying for them and even talks about the content of his prayer. And then he ends off the chapter with a glorious proclamation that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. But speaking concerning, as I said, this issue of Trinitarian salvation, how the Trinity works in, uh, in unison to bring about salvation for the people of God, if you will remember, if you have watched the first few parts of this series through Ephesians, then you will recall that in verses 3 through 6 we contemplated and we saw how the Father, what, what His role was in, in salvation, bringing about salvation for the people of God. In fact, the, the last sermon uh, that I preached on, uh, on this text, back in verse 6, was, um, was about salvation being unto the glory of God and how God does it for His own glory. But now we find ourselves in verse 7. And verse 7 is truly glorious and the beginning of verse 8 as well. And so we're going to see here in this sermon, we're going to see the redemption that the Son of God procures for us. Redemption by the Son of God. And we're going to see three things concerning this redemptive work. And that is one, how is it brought about? It is brought out by the blood of Christ. Brought about by the blood of Christ. What is it? What does it actually bring about for us? Forgiveness of sins. And then why? Because of God's amazing Grace. So, how, what, and why? So, let us consider, firstly, the redemption that the Son of God procures for us. He brings about for us the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, to do that, we're going to look at the beginning of verse 7. Paul writes these simple words. He says, In Him we have redemption. And that really could be all that we could look at in this sermon, but I do not want to necessarily go at a snail's pace through this and want to eventually make it through the whole book of Ephesians. So we, we must keep a good pace as we go through here. But nonetheless, in him we have redemption. This speaks to the centrality of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is the centerpiece of our faith. He's the object of our faith. He's the object of the gospel of grace. In fact, uh, I often have said this before when I've preached is that if anyone is preaching a gospel that has anything uh, that that's focused on anything else besides the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a false gospel. It's not the gospel of grace. It's another gospel, and they're anathema. That's the seriousness of this. All throughout the Bible, Christ is the centerpiece. He's the crown jewel. He's the summit of all things, and everything redounds to His glory. A text that supports this centrality is, um, is John 1, the chapter of John 1. In fact, I, I could read the entirety of John 1, and that would support this idea of Christ being central. But I specifically want to zoom in on verses 14 through 18. Listen to what John wrote. This is, this is some very weighty um, subject matter. He says in verse 14, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about Him and cried out, saying, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for He existed before me. So even, the, even John's preaching, what was it about? It was about Christ. He was coming to say, prepare the way of the Lord. All of John the Baptist's preaching was pointing to Christ. That's what our preaching should be. Brethren, and what I mean by our preaching, I mean our con our conversations with the lost. When we are sharing, when we say we're sharing the gospel with them, our proclamation should be about Christ. It should be all about Him. And in verse sixteen, it continues. Uh, John writes, "For of His fullness we have all received in grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses; grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. Who is the subject matter of these four verses here? Verses fourteen through eighteen. Who is the subject matter? It is Christ. It's all Jesus." There's, there's a Christocentricity. That's a little big word for Christ is central to everything about our lives. Not only is he central in all things concerning Scripture, but he ought to be central in our lives. In fact, we are, we are a walking testimony. Uh, whether we are testi testifying by our lives and our actions, 
to sinfulness and the pleasures of sin, or are we testifying to the glory of God and the saving power of the gospel message? How we live is what we're telling the world. Our actions speak louder than our words, as the saying goes. And we ought to reflect the glory of Jesus Christ. So he's central. He is central when it comes to salvation. And that's, that's, that's what the beginning of verse 7 says. In him. It's the second word Paul employs in this sentence. It's in him. It's, it's all about Jesus Christ. So after coming about, um, after just speaking on the Father's work, he then moves to focus on the Son and the centrality of Christ in his saving work. Secondly, I want us to consider also is his role in Christ's role in salvation. So we know he's central to the subject of salvation and, of course, the gospel itself. But what is what exactly is his role? Well, many, 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 many places can I go to in Scripture to support this. But there's one that I specifically want to zoom in on. Other than this verse here in Ephesians one seven. I want to contemplate out of John, again, out of the book of John, in John chapter 10, in verses 27 through 30. And listen to what John writes. He records Jesus saying these words. This is Jesus speaking here. Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. And... No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. It's glorious. It really is. This text speaks to what we call, and what theologians have called, and there's so much biblical data concerning this, it's called the covenant of redemption. The covenant of redemption. Now to understand this, and I've spoken on this before in previous sermons, so this will be more of a a review of what we've already considered. But just to go back, especially what we're looking at in verses 3-6 through here in Ephesians 1, concerning the Father's work, what happened in eternity past concerning this covenant of redemption? Well, that's the thing. It first began, it, it happened some point in eternity past between the members of the Trinity. The Father, in His wisdom, in His, in His, in His infinite knowledge, chose and selected a certain people to save unto Himself, to redeem. We talked about uh, there in, in Ephesians 5 when it says uh, that He predestined us to adoption of sons, you know, predestination. Uh, and verse 4 even talks about uh, God's electing uh, us unto salvation. So God selects a people unto himself to save and to redeem by the blood of his Son. And then in, 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 in this covenant of redemption, which is basically an agreement, it's a compact between two parties, or perhaps multiple parties, um, that, that's what a covenant is. And so in, in eternity past, the Father selects these people to save, and then he commissions his son. He enters into a covenant agreement, a compact with the son. This is where the son's role comes into salvation. And the son agrees to come in and to die and to lay himself down as a, as a, as a spotless lamb on behalf of this people the Father has chosen. So we see the Father and the Son, and then later on we're going to see how the Spirit also takes part in this covenant between the members of the Trinity, and he and, and he also has a, a role to play in all of this. But we're focusing specifically here on the Son. So the Son agrees to die for these select elect people, to lay his life down for them. And then he's also given a promise. The Father promises in eternity past that if the Son does this, if he dies for these people, he will give them to his Son as a bride unto himself, and he will forever be with this, this select people, and he will, he will um, be rewarded with a kingdom, and he will rule forever and ever. He will rule on the throne of his father David. All these glorious truths and, and the glorious rewards are spoken of all throughout Scripture. That, that's some of the content of the, the covenant of redemption as we see that more unfolded here in this text. And uh, specifically here in John 10, it's very clear because he says, My father, in verse 29, My father who has given them to me. So the, he, he says it's a completed action. He uses a past tense there. This is something that has already happened. The father has given this select people to his son to die and to redeem by his precious blood. And so the son's role in salvation is to obey the elective purposes of the father, to die for this elect people, the church, 
the bride of Christ, and then to receive the rewards for his sufferings. That's, that's his uh, part in this covenant. It's glorious. He is to bring about redemption, as the verse uh, reads, in him we have redemption. Uh, what is redemption, though? What, what, that word redemption, uh, what, what does it actually mean? What's the definition? Well, uh, the English word redemption, the etymology of this word comes from an old French, redemption, and then actually the French comes from uh, the Latin word for redemption. And that word, the Latin word, means a buying back, releasing, or ransoming. So he's purchasing us, and we'll talk about later how that's purchasing, purchasing us out of slavery, buying us back. He's ransoming us. And uh, the, English, the English word, the definition of this word, the English one uh, for redemption, is a deliverance from sin, salvation. That's specifically in relation to theology. And then the Greek, now this is, this is where we get into really, what, 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 was, what did the word mean to Paul when he was writing it? And uh, the Greek word uh, here means a, a releasing affected by payment of ransom, redemption, deliverance, liberation procured by the payment of a ransom. So it's very, very, very precise definition here that someone is released from bondage, released from slavery. They're delivered. They're, they're, they're given freedom by the payment of a ransom. They're, they're purchased, you could say. And that's derived from a, another Greek word, a, a, a root word. And that Greek word means the price of redeeming, ransom, and it's paid for slaves. It, it, it was used in reference to slaves and, and freeing captives. In fact, Jesus used this word in Matthew twenty twenty eight when he said, The Son of Man did not come to, to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And then that word, that word that uh, Jesus used there uh, in, in Matthew twenty twenty eight for ransom, even that word is derived from another Greek word, which means to loose, to break, and to dissolve. So it has this root meaning concerning this truth, concerning this reality, that it's a buying, it's a, it's a freedom. It, has, it, it carries with it many different senses, but it's all, it's all one in, in, in one in one in one sense. And so we could say redemption is freedom, liberation, a buying, a purchasing back, a paying of a ransom. Now I want us to consider this redemption by the Son, by the Lord Jesus Christ. How did he bring about redemption? How did he do it? And that is found in the second part of verse 7, which it says, In him we have redemption through his blood. Three words through his blood to really understand the meaning the significance of this concept we must go back to the old testament uh, and we must consult specifically the pentateuch or the law and even more specifically the book of leviticus has much data concerning this in fact i'm going to turn over to uh, to leviticus chapter 4 we're going to understand, we're, we, want to, we want to get an understanding of the Old Testament sacrificial system, the Old Testament law concerning blood sacrifice or concerning an animal uh, uh, being sacrificed for the sins of uh, someone else. And that is a, a picture, as we know from the book of Hebrews, a foreshadowing of what Christ was coming to do. Uh, we're going to read uh, just a portion here, a pretty large portion out of Leviticus 4, beginning in verse 27. And, uh, and it, it reads these, it, this word, these words. It says, Now if any one of the common people sins unintentionally in doing any of the things which the Lord has commanded not to be done and becomes guilty, if his, if his sin which he has committed is made known to him, then he shall bring for his offering a, a goat, a female without defect for his sin which he has committed. He shall lay his, his hand on the head of the sin offering and slay the sin offering at the place of the burnt offering. The priest shall take some of its blood with its finger and put it on the horns of the altar and the burnt offering. And all the rest of its blood he shall pour out at the base of the altar. Then he shall remove all of its fat, just as the fat was removed from the sacrifice of peace offerings. And then the priest shall offer it up in smoke on the altar for a soothing aroma to the Lord. 
Thus the priest shall make atonement for him, and he will be forgiven. But if he brings a lamb as his offering for a sin offering, he shall bring it a female without defect. He shall lay his head, or excuse me, his hand on the head of the sin offering and slay it for a sin offering in the place where they slay the burnt offering. The priest is to take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of the burnt offering and all the rest of its blood he shall pour out at the base of the altar. Then he shall remove all its fat just as the fat of the lamb is removed from the sacrifice of the peace offerings. And the priest shall offer them up in smoke on the altar and on the offerings by fire to the Lord. Thus the priest shall make atonement for him in regard to his sin which he has committed and he will be forgiven. So, sacrifice in the Old Testament was meticulous. It was so meticulous and detailed. Very, very detailed. God is a God of order and detail. And in the sacrificial system in the Old Testament, as we just read, these very, these intricate rules and laws concerning sin offerings and guild offerings and how the priest is to take the blood of that animal and, and put it in various places for atonement to cover the sin of that person, it shows us the holiness of God in fact, in the book of Leviticus, the word holy is used over 80 times. Another text is out of Exodus. Exodus 29, 36 reads, Each day you shall offer a bull as a sin offering in the, for atonement, and you shall purify the altar when you make atonement for it, and you shall anoint it to consecrate it. And that is, again, God commanding the priests to bring about um, these various sacrifices to atone for the people's sin. Another place is out of Leviticus chapter 5, and we're just going to go through there really quickly in verses 4 through 6. It says, Or if a person swears thoughtlessly with his lips to do evil or to do good in whatever matter a man may speak thoughtlessly with an oath, and it is hidden from him, and then he comes to know it, he will be guilty in one of these. So it shall be when he becomes guilty in one of these, that he shall confess that in which he has sinned. He shall also bring his guilt offering to the Lord for his sin, which he has committed, a female from the flock, a lamb or a goat, as a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement on his behalf for his sin. Again, it, the meticulous rules uh, that these animals are to be sacrificed to take away the sins of the people. Leviticus chapter 6, just uh, one more chapter over. In verse 1, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, When a person sins and acts unfaithfully against the Lord... And deceives his companion in regard to a deposit or a security entrusted to him, or through robbery, or if he has extorted from his companion, or has found what was lost and lied about it, or has sworn falsely, so that he sins in regard to any one of the things as a man may do, then it shall be when he sins and becomes guilty that he shall restore what he took by robbery, or what he got by extortion." or the deposit which was entrusted to him, or the lost thing which he found. Or anything about which he swore falsely, he shall make restitution for it in full, and add to it one-fifth more. He shall give it to the one to whom it belongs on the day he presents his guilt offering. Then he shall bring to the priest his guilt offering to the Lord, a ram without defect from the flock, according to your valuation." For a guilt offering, and the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord, and he will be given, or he simply he will be forgiven for any one of the things which he may have done to incur guilt. This is incredible. This really is incredible. The the detail that God uh, goes to describe these various sacrifices, and I could read much, much, much more. But that's just that little portion I wanted to consider there. But we ask ourselves, uh, in, in relation, especially as we read out of, out of Leviticus 4, why did God institute this idea of shedding the blood of the animal? What, what was the purpose of that? What was the purpose of, the, of it being so bloody and so gory? Well, the Bible actually tells us in Leviticus chapter 17, in verse 11, simply the text reads, For the life of the flesh is in its blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. In other words, what God is saying here is simply this. The blood is the life of the creature, and that's obviously just a simple scientific fact that the life of an, uh, an animal or a human being is, is in his blood. If we don't have blood in our veins, we're dead. 
But also, we can tell so much. We can discern so much about our health by our blood. In fact, you go to the doctor, you tell them you're not feeling well, they're going to run blood work on you because they can discern so much about your health just by taking a look at your blood. So even in a scientific sense, that's true. But this is much deeper than that. It's a spiritual reality that the life of the creatures in its blood, the blood symbolizes life, as the text reads here. So when these animals are being sacrificed, their throats are being slit, and the blood is spilling out, and, and, the, and the, 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 the high priest goes and puts this blood in the various places in the temple and the horns of the altar and, and pours out the blood, that is a symbol that the life of that creature has been required of it rather than the life of the person, rather than the life of the sinner. It's this it's this beautiful idea of life for life, tooth for tooth, punch for punch. God is just, and he must punish the wicked. He must punish sin. And so he institutes this system of animal sacrifice where the animals take the punishment. But as we know from the book of Hebrews, really, an animal cannot take away sin. It was all a foreshadow. It was showing us something. Christ was coming to redeem his people. He was going to pour out his blood unto death. And so the reason that it was a gory system of bloodshed was to show us that God is holy and he requires of the sinner his life. And it is by the blood of Jesus Christ do we obtain redemption. It is the means of redemption. It is a means to that end of redemption. The book of Hebrews is laden with, with content concerning these truths. In fact, I'm going to turn there to the book of Hebrews in chapter 10. I'd invite you to turn there with me as well in Hebrews chapter 10. And in verse, in verse we're going to begin at verse 1. It says these words, for the law, since it, has, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sin? Otherwise, or excuse me, but in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In, in whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. After saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure of them, of them, excuse me, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering Time after time, the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool of his feet. For by one offering he is perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart and on their mind. I will write them. Then he says, and their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. Christ came to fulfill all the Old Testament was pointing to. And so in relation to the spilling of the blood of animals and these, these sheep, these goats, these bulls, it was pointing to the, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that was soon to be spilled on behalf of his people to cleanse us from our sin. Hebrews chapter 7. Turn there with me to Hebrews 7, verse 26. The text reads these words, For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the, of his, of the people, because he did this, because he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints man as high priests who are weak, 
But the word of the oath, which came after the law, appoints a son made perfect forever. He came and fulfilled all that, and so he spilled his blood. That's what Romans 3 tells us, Romans 3, 24. See, it says, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. There's that word redemption as we see here in Ephesians 1. Then verse 25, listen to what it says. Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Hallelujah. That's amazing. He poured out his blood. He is our propitiation. Romans 5, just two chapters later in verse 9, listen to what it says. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. At that cross, as Christ's blood is spilling out, even before as he's being beat, as he's being, as he's being whipped and mocked and spat upon, as he's, as he's covered in blood, it was a gory, a way of dying. As his blood is being poured out of that cross... It was symbolizing that his life, that his precious life was being required of him rather than our own lives being required of us. Rather than our own lives being required of us eternally. 1 Peter chapter 1 says, You were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold, from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. He redeemed us by his blood. That's the means of redemption. How was redemption accomplished for us? By the blood of Jesus. It is a it is a purchasing, it is a purchasing power to it. Now, I'm not speaking of the actual physical drops of blood Jesus spilled out. I'm talking about the symbol, the symbolic nature of his blood, that it symbolized his life being required of him, and therefore his life was, was in the place of our life. He stood in our stead, in our room, in our place for us, and the Father crushed him instead of us. As if Isaiah 53, 10 tells us, it pleased Yahweh to crush him. That, that's, that is what it means when it says Christ purchased us by his blood. In Luke chapter 22, verse 19 and verse 20, this is, a, this is the Last Supper. Jesus tells his disciples um, concerning his blood and concerning how that relates to the New Covenant. Listen to what he says in uh, or, um, verse 19. It begins, And when he had taken some of the bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So there's the bread and uh, symbolizing his body being broken for us. And then verse 20, And in the same way he took the cup, after they had eaten, saying, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. It symbolized his blood being poured out and that inaugurated the new covenant. We just read that out of Hebrews. He's done away with the old and the in with the new. Therefore, there no longer has to be any more sacrifices being offered up time and time again. In fact, listen to, what, um, listen to how Hebrews chapter 9 describes uh, describes Christ and how he has brought in the new covenant, how he has um, accomplished our eternal salvation. Hebrews chapter 9, beginning in verse 11. It says, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. There is that word again. Notice every time, or at least it seems many many texts that we go to, and we see the blood of Christ being spoken of, it oftentimes is linked with redemption, that word there. And that, that is significant, very significant. But anyways, it continues, verse 13. For if the blood and of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer... Sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That is incredible. So incredible. So glorious. It truly is. So that is how he, he procures our redemption. That's how. But what exactly is redemption in the sense of, we know what it, it, the, the definition of the word is, even in the original Greek as we saw, but specifically, 
what is the essence of redemption when it says we Christ buys us out of slavery? We're broken. Uh, we're our, those bonds are broken. What, what's it? What's it referencing? It's referencing sin. That's the next thing I want us to see. Is what? What? What's the? What's the matter of redemption? What's? What's the essence of it? And it's forgiveness of sin. It is forgiveness of sin. That's the essence of eternal redemption. In fact, if you go back with me to Ephesians chapter 1, in verse 7, third part of verse 7 says, so I'll read the first two, in fact, um, it says, in him we have redemption through his blood, and then it says, the forgiveness of our trespasses. He procures forgiveness for us. He brings it about by shedding his blood. Sin. What is sin? What's its nature and its consequences? Well, very simply, uh, as 1 John 3, 4 tells us, it says, Sin is the transgression of the law. And that's the King James there. Sin is transgression of the law. It is breaking God's holy law. God in His perfect character has given us His law. You shall not lie, blaspheme, steal. We break His law, and that is the essence of sin. When we act in contradiction to God's perfect character by breaking His law. And so it's an offense to God. It's an affront to God. And that's its nature, and its consequences are hell. Sin's consequences are eternal hellfire. As the Second Peter 2 foretells us, it says, For God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, and committed them to the pits of darkness reserved for judgment. That's what hell is. It's a, it's a place of outer darkness. For the wicked. Sin is like a, a, a vicious cancer, even in his nature. Um, when, it, when we are we, we're born infected by it and, it, and it just festers like a disgusting gangrene. And it, it has horrible effect upon our souls, both eternally and even uh, temporally. In this life, sin brings us great affliction and pain, just by its temporal effects. But in relation to etern eternity, it brings hellfire, eternal hell. Sin is horrible, horrible. And because of it, we are we are we are separated from the presence of God. We are cast out. We are we are outcast. We are filthy and unclean, and we cannot approach a holy God, a burning, uh, uh, consuming fire, a just judge. We cannot walk close to Him because of our filth and our sin against God. And so redemption is the forgiveness of those sins. As the text reads, in him we have redemption through his blood. And then it, it tells us what is that redemption? The forgiveness of our trespasses. That is the essence of redemption. And in Colossians, the book of Colossians, very which is very similar to the book of Ephesians, they're like sisters. Uh, they're, they're identical, almost like identical twins, you could say. And in Colossians 1, has very similar word um, word choice Paul employs there. Very similar. It's almost as if uh, it's almost as if um, he probably consulted one of these works when he wrote the other. I, I don't know, or perhaps he just had that in mind. You know, he had written um, one of them before the other and had that in mind as he was writing the other one, and therefore they have such similar content. But listen to what it says in Colossians chapter one. Uh, in beginning in verses, uh, verse 13, and then I will also read verse 14. Uh, it says, He rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption. Okay, that's very clear, we know that. But then listen to what it says at the end of verse 14. The forgiveness of sins. So he enumerates, he, he, he further explains, okay, we have redemption. Here's what redemption is. It's forgiveness of sin. God redeems us. From our sin, he buys us out of slavery to sin. What are we? We're slaves. We are slaves to sin. Constantly. And we have no hope. We have no hope in it of ourselves. And we're just simply awaiting the final judgment. When our souls will be lost eternally. And so, but Christ comes into this world and buys us out of slavery, he takes our place that we deserve, that we deserve to be in. And he, he satisfies the wrath of God and therefore purchases us. He legally, he legally um, authorizes our being set free from, from sin. That's the beauty of, redemp of redemption. The cross is our only hope. The cross is the only hope for a sinner. 
It's the only hope for slavery from uh, for being set free from slavery to sin. In fact, there's a few texts of Scripture that speak of slavery to sin. In Romans chapter 6, verse 17, listen to what it says, But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having now been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Jesus said in John 8, verse 34, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son sets you, makes you free, you will be free indeed. Christ sets sinners who are enslaved to their sin. He sets them free. Free. We have freedom in Christ. So glorious. So glorious. The cross truly is our only hope. There's no, nothing like this in any other religion in other worldview, you just don't find this beautiful idea and this concept of just, perfect, complete, eternal redemption. It is not found anywhere else. So that is the what of redemption. So we saw how, by the blood of Christ, what, the forgiveness of sin. Thirdly, why? 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 God's Amazing grace, that is why. Because God is full of grace towards sinners. He's full of grace towards sinful humanity. Listen to what the end of Ephesians 1, or excuse me, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, and then in the beginning of verse 8 says, According to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us, us. Grace, grace, God's amazing grace. It is his motivation for saving us. In fact, uh, turn with me to Ephesians 2, just one chapter over. Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 1. Paul gives a very strong um, treatment of the bad news in relation to our fallenness, but then he, he speaks here in Ephesians 2 about the glory of of God's saving grace and how he is he is condescend to save us. Verse I'll begin in verse 1. He says, "And you, speaking to the Ephesians who were once lost but now they've been saved." He says, "And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience." Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast." That's pretty incredible. That is God's motivation. God condescends to save us because He is abundant and rich in mercy and grace. Grace, grace, grace. Notice there in verse 7 it says, So that in the ages to come He might show the surpassing riches of His grace. Notice it's not enough for Him to say the surpassing grace of God. And it's not, it's not enough for him to say the riches of God's grace. He has to say the surpassing riches of God's grace. It's just incredible. He cannot, he cannot um, use proper language to describe the glory of God's grace. What is grace? God's, uh, Christ's rich, um, excuse me, God's riches at Christ's expense. It is God showing favor to the sinner apart from merit. Favor apart from merit. A Psalm 84 11 says, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uh, uprightly. Psalm 145 verse 8 says, The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great in loving kindness. That is why God has saved us. And notice it is never to the negation of his holiness. It's never to the negation of his holy, uh, to his justice. They're always in beautiful harmony with one another. And so we see the manifold wisdom and the glory of God in the gospel message in Christ redeeming us. 
according to the riches of God's grace. That word riches there is the Greek word plutos. Plutos. And it means uh, riches, wealth, fullness, abundance, plentitude. It's just overflowing. It's overwhelming how great God's redeeming grace is. Christ is the perfect display of God's grace, which he's lavished, lavished on us. Lavished on us. Incredible. Incredible. And where I want to go to consider that is in Titus chapter 2. In verse 11. And I'm going to read to verse 14. Christ is the the ultimate display of God's grace. In other words, what I mean by that is he... If you want to consider and contemplate God's grace and what that looks like, go to the cross. Go to Christ. What did John write in John 1? For of his fullness... We have received and grace upon grace. It's almost as even when John wrote that, you cannot find the proper language. So he just says, grace upon grace. It's layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. Does God show us favor apart from works in his son? Notice what it says in Titus 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared. Who is the grace of God? It's, it's almost as if he's using the word grace to, to it's just synonymous with Jesus. Synonymous. He's grace personified. Because he says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. That's Christ. That's Christ. And, and Christ is the one who brings salvation to sinners. And so he's speaking of grace here, but it's just synonymous with Christ. Verse 12, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. He has lavished grace on us, brethren. Lavish grace! The children of God have God's amazing grace just poured out on them in His, in His Son. Christ is the perfect manifestation of God's grace. In the Old Testament times, the saints looked and saw from afar the glory of Christ, but not in its fullness. They were looking through a hazy image through a foggy window, out into the glorious field of God's saving grace as it is revealed in Christ. Brethren, I call you to rest today, to rest in this precious reality of what Christ has done for us. Notice, never does this text say we have done anything for ourselves or we have accomplished anything. It is all Christ, all Him. And so, what is the requirement? It is faith. Faith in his, in his work. See, we are saved by works, brethren, just not the works of our own doing. Not our own work, but the work of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, so that He is glorified. Also, know these things. I encourage you to be, to be noble Bereans and to go and to study these things which I have spoken on because there is so much more depth that I could not go into in this limited time that I have here today. I encourage you to take these texts and study and find other ta- passages that speak to the things which you've seen here in Ephesians chapter 1. And when you do so, know Christ. We, we are called to love the Lord our God with our minds. So often do we find ourselves, especially in modern day contemporary evangelical Christianity, there's a lack of emphasis on knowing God, knowing who He is, a lot of it is put on experientialism and a feeling. But instead, our, our knowledge of Christ ought to be based off just that knowledge, not experience. 
but knowing the truth of Scripture. So let's go to Scripture. Study the Word of God. Know these things. And so that you may be able to give a proper account to a lost and dying world, to sinners who need to hear this, so that they might be saved. And you sinners, you ungodly perverts, I call you to repent, to flee your sin, to flee your rebellion, to flee your self-trust. You are chasing things which are not glorious, but are just filthy. And have no value. They're just worthless things. You, you, the life, the life you're living is a worthless life. It's a worthless life. Repent. Change your mind. That's what repentance means. Change your mind about your sin. And believe. Are you washed in the blood of Christ? Now I'm not speaking again of some physical blood actually cleansing you. I'm talking about have you been purchased by Jesus who shed blood at the cross? For the redemption of your sin. Have you fallen upon Christ. And cried out to him. That he might cleanse you by his precious blood. He might cleanse your filthy conscience. Flee. Flee to the Savior. Flee to the Son of God. Who is the Redeemer of God's elect. Who is seated at the right hand of God. Enthroned above the heavens. And who lives to make intercession. For all of those who draw near to God through him. Do you have redemption in Christ? No. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. Do not. If the Good Shepherd is calling out to you through the outward call of the Gospel, if you know in your heart that you must be saved, and you say, And you want to ask me, Sir, what must I do to be saved? Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved from your sin for the glory of God. So we have seen here in this text, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, the beginning of verse 8, is redemption by the Son, redemption by Christ. How is it accomplished? By the blood of Christ? What is it? It is the forgiveness of sin. And why? Because of God's saving, redeeming, justifying, amazing grace. God is gracious and holy and just, loving and merciful. As we've contemplated these various attributes of God throughout this text, it's true, all of those attributes are God's attributes. And they are perfectly descriptive of who He is. And in His holiness, in His justice, He gave us His law. He said, you shall not lie or steal or blaspheme. You shall not disobey your parents. But oh, how we have done these things. We have lied, we have stolen, we have all blasphemed, we have all dishonored God. We have trampled underfoot His perfect law and we deserve His punishment for sin. That law which shows us God's perfect character, we have broken. And we deserve hell. We, are, we find ourselves in a situation of terrible plight without any hope in and of ourselves and condemned to hellfire. But God, the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the grace of God manifest. Jesus came down and fulfilled the law and died upon a cross outside of Jerusalem some 2,000 years ago to propitiate the wrath of God. And he rose again. The Father rose him up from the grave as the public display he had received his son's sacrifice as the ransom to buy us out of slavery to sin. And he is now seated in heaven. And his command is to repent and to believe, to flee, for the sinner to flee their sin and to believe upon Christ And the promise is that if a sinner does that, they will be saved. They will be forgiven of all their sin. They will be redeemed. And they will be given the righteousness of Christ. Wrapped in the perfect righteousness of Christ. God will look at them as if they they lived Jesus' life because He looked at Christ as if He lived their life. And for even the Christian, the call of the gospel is to continue to believe it. To keep on believing. To keep on repenting. To keep on resting in the finished work of Christ. For it is he who endures to the end will be saved. It is all to the glory of God. 
all of this, all of these glorious truths and these glorious these glorious concepts that are put forth in scriptures all to the end that God would be glorified, that the Lord Jesus Christ would be glorified, that the Holy Spirit in His work in salvation, which we'll see later on, and even in His work enabling the Son to do what He did to bring Him glory. It's to bring the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, glory. And so it is to the God of glory, the triune God, I say, to Him be glory, both now and forevermore. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, be glorified in us as your word has been preached. May unconverted souls be saved this day. May your people be edified. And may your Son be glorified in us and in everything. And it is through Jesus, through his intercession, do I come before you, Father. It is only by faith in his name are we saved? It's in His name we pray. Amen. Amen.